Hello. We are doing Romana Guardini's book, The Lord, here at St. Babo in Mishawaka. And we're on to chapter one of part three of the book, The Lord. Part three is entitled The Decision. And the first chapter of part three, chapter one of part three, is entitled The Blind and the Seeing. In this particular chapter, Romano Guardini is, is focused on the account of the man born blind in John chapter 9. Now, of course, the context of this is this uh, uh, struggle that's going on between uh, Jesus and the leaders of the people. Um, and he, he, he begins that way. We, he says, we've already spoken of the clash between Jesus and the Pharisees in Jerusalem. It's, it's probably to this that John refers as early as the 5th and 6th chapters, certainly in, de in the detailed 7th to 10th chapters. This conflict, he says, is so grave that the henchmen are sent to arrest Jesus, but they actually return without having executed the order. And the Pharisees say, why have you not brought him? The attendants answered, never has a, a man spoken as this man. Strange reply for constables, says Guardini. The divine authority of him whom they are supposed to seize, the power of his personality and words is so great that they dare not lay hands on him. Thereupon, the Pharisees' significant statement, Have you also been led astray? Has any one of the rulers believed in him? Or any of the Pharisees? But this crowd, which does not know the law, is accursed. So there's a distinction between the... Uh, almost like a caste system, uh, dividing uh, people in this society, okay? And in the, in the case of this controversy, the first group uh, was the Pharisees, those people uh, that knew uh, you know, the law, the science of the law, and the tenets of right and wrong, permissible and forbidden. In other words, those acquainted with the law, symbolism, and mysticism of the temple, says Guardini. And then the other group is those who did not, the uninitiated and the ignorant. The first group consisted of the intellectuals, the scribes and the Pharisees. The second of the crowd, in quotation marks. The, that intellectual dividing line cuts so deep that a man from the lowest level of society who knew the law stood higher than an ignorant son of a high priest. Isn't that interesting? In other words, it was now a matter of, of mastery of a, of a religious system. And now the most revered among the initiated say none of us none of us will have anything to do with the folly and blasphemy of this man referring to jesus only the masses who are ignorant of the law can find any good in him and they say these uh, intellectuals say curses on them you know, this gives us a clue to the truly divine blessedness which Jesus pronounces over the poor in spirit. The crowd, despised and cursed by the erudite, by those who knew something, so to speak, were open to Jesus and his message. 
If only that crowd had remained loyal, how unspeakably blessed they would have been. They would have been blessed with all the beatific joy of the Isaiah prophecies. Remember those mentioned before? Those prophecies in Isaiah? You know, the wolf lying down with the lamb, you know, God's holy mountain with the great feast, those kind of prophecies. If the people had had faith in Jesus. Shortly after this incident, the Lord meets a blind man in the street and feels himself called upon by this brother living in darkness to perform works of light in the service of him who sent me. Jesus' Father, God, right? Him who sent me. And he says, as long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. And Jesus spits on the ground, which was a practice common to ancient therapeutics, which attributed healing powers to spittle, kneads it with dust, spreads the resultant paste over the blind eyes, and commands the invalid to go and wash in the waters of Siloam or silo, he, uh, he says here. The blind man obeys and returns seeing. This creates a tremendous uproar. The man is brought before the Pharisees. They question him. He replies, The man who is called Jesus made clay and anointed my eyes and said to me, Go to the pool of silo and wash. And I went and washed and I see. The miracle makes a profound impression. Some of the Pharisees actually side with the man, capable of such wonders. Others, however, declare, this man is not from God, for he does not keep the Sabbath. They ask the former blind man his opinion, and he gives the only answer he can after such an experience. He's a prophet. Okay. The matter is then referred to the high council right? They refused to believe that the man had really been blind, and they summoned his parents, who testified that he is their son and had been blind from birth. But knowing that the council bans anyone who recognizes Jesus as the Messiah, they dodged the question asked concerning the manner of the healing. They are afraid. They're afraid of the authority of that high council. And they're afraid of losing all their stuff and being pushed out of the uh, uh, fellowship of the people. Actually, the decision about the blind man has already fallen. but And it's irrevocable. But the hearing continues. So... This this hearing just continues. We would say pro forma. It's not. Uh, it, it's not going to come to any other conclusion. But the hearing goes on. What did he do to thee? How did he open thy eyes? And the man who was healed grows impatient. He's already told them, often enough. The facts are perfectly clear. But the interrogators have little interest in facts. They actually hope that by withholding the official recognition of the healing and by heaping Jesus with calumny, they can cover up the miracle. Can you imagine that? It, that miracle, it blazes brightly before their eyes, but they do not see it because they do not wish to see it. And they wrap it in a cloud of darkness so that no one else can. That's chilling and stunning when you think about it. Here, here's God's only begotten son doing this miracle for a poor blind man who was blind from birth. And these people, they just, they put the kibosh on it any way they can. 
As for the embarrassing witness, they hope to intimidate him so that he'll be quiet. Okay, so that's the next strategy they use. Notice there's a number of things they do in order to back up their blindness. Okay, I, I, I count three so far, right? Uh, first, they withhold the recognition of the healing. Second, they heap Jesus with calumny. And third, they try to intimidate the witness. But the man, the, the man who was uh, blind and cured of his blindness by Jesus, stands his ground. So they place him under ban. Okay. Uh, at this point, it gets serious. They're going to they're gonna take away everything. This is like, wow. Uh, he's thrust out of the community. That's what the ban means, to be placed under the ban. Um, he's thrust out of the community, and they take away his property. They take away access to his own property. Um, being uh, uh, under the Enlightenment view that was given to me as an American by my British ancestors who, like Locke, you know, those are... Uh, pretty fundamental rights to take away from somebody. Uh, remember, uh, Locke said life, uh, liberty, and property. Uh, uh, and, and of course, Jefferson uh, changed it in the Declaration of Independence to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. But shoot, they're going to take the blind man's property away. When Jesus hears all this, and he hears what happened to this witness who was blind and now sees. He goes to him. And he asks a question. So this guy's in real trouble. He's lost everything. He's testified to the leaders who've rejected him. Everything. But Jesus goes right to the core of the issue anyway. This is bold when you think about it really bold on Jesus' part. He says, Do you believe in the Son of God? Who is he, Lord, that I may believe in him? Says the man who was cured. You have both seen him, and he it is who speaks to you. And the man who was born blind and now healed falls on his knees and worships. He worships Jesus. We step back from this for a minute and remind you that for Guardini, the whole point of his sketches that he does of Scripture is to listen to the Word of God as he hears it in what? In the worship of the church. Now here's a point in the Gospel of John where this man, deprived of everything else, but truthful to what Jesus did for him, worships. And out of that worship comes an insight from Jesus. So we, in light of Guardini's method and of the profundity of this passage in the Gospel of John, we should step back and hear what Jesus says. He turns to the bystanders and he says, For judgment I have come into this world that they who do not see may see and they who see may become blind. Chilling words. Gordini comments now. Extraordinarily impressive event, he says. Here, outer developments and inner sense the immediate incident and its bearing upon the whole of Christ's works are powerfully united. It all fits together. The key, says Bordini, to this union lies in the words for judgment. Okay? And Bordini reminds us that 
These words are reminiscent of similar ironic passages like, I've come to call sinners, not the just. Okay? So these contrasts. I'm calling the blind, not the seeing. The sinners, not the just. Or of Jesus' jubilant, I praise thee, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you did hide these things from the wise and prudent, and you reveal them to little ones. So again, the wise and the prudent miss out. And the little ones have the gospel preached to them. And they're redeemed. Isn't that amazing? And he says, the little ones are minors in the eyes of the world. And they're going to become knowing, just, great, and free. Those who ever, however, who consider themselves already great, who are loath to relinquish their earthly knowledge, are adolescent fools. I remember. I remember there was a guy I knew when I was an undergraduate at Notre Dame. He would, he would grunt puerile meanderings of an adolescent mind. Puerile meanderings of an adolescent mind. That's what this passage here in Guardini reminds me of here. He's contrasting the real wisdom of the little ones, the sinners, and the blind, with the wise, the clever, the powerful. And all the wise, the clever, and the powerful start sounding like a bunch of puerile adolescents. Sophomoric, you know? Just all messed up inside their heads. And they're going to remain so. Here behind the miraculous healing of the man born blind lies the same thought, only more powerfully, sharply focused. Jesus knows that he has come, that those who do not see may see, and they who see may become blind. There's this moment of decision. Right? So Gordini now is going to give us a a sense of what this blindness is really like. And it's really one of the most uh, powerful sections in Guardini where he's helping us see what it means to be blind. And by the time we're done with this, we recognize how blind we might be. He says, blind are those who realize that with all their earthly insight and knowledge, they stand in the dark be before the divine, utterly incapable of comprehending the essential. I was talking to a friend this week who was telling me that a common friend of ours was going through a dark time. And wisely, this particular friend who was explaining this to me, kind of asking me for some insight about it, clearly saw something that um, is in church tradition. It's very clearly in church tradition in the life of St. Therese, the little flower. She talks about going into the darkness with love. So she herself is struggling in her dark night of the soul, comprehending the essential, as Guardini says. The, the, uh, the essential with a capital E, by the way. So the essential here is just another name for God. You can't comprehend God in this darkness. And Guardini wisely says, he who admits this truth to himself and to his God, encounters the light of the world. So we have to really worry not if we're going into the darkness. We have to worry if we think we see when we really don't. I think that that's the point. 
Because as soon as he, someone admits the truth to themselves and to God, that they're in the darkness, like Therese did, then there's a possibility, at least, that they can encounter the light of the world. And, of course, it's more than a possibility if they're in that to-and-fro loving relationship with God. God never fails, ever fails in that way. He's always there, always ready to receive his beloved sons and daughters, but not on our terms, on his. In his clarity, he recognizes God's messenger the new order, the budding new creation. And the more a person in that situation sees, the more seeing he grows, comprehending the things of God's kingdom more and more deeply and fully. Thus the inner eye feeds on what it sees, and the greater its strength, the greater the abundance that is revealed to it. But you can summarize it in that expression I learned uh, emphasized by John Donne. Faith is seeing light with your heart when all your eyes see is darkness. If you admit that all your intellect can see is darkness, and yet you continue to allow God to enkindle your heart, you can still get somewhere in the life of faith. On the other hand, the people that think that they are the seeing are those who in God's presence still cling to their earthly point of view. This is Guardini again. Their earthly knowledge, earthly conceptions of justice, naively attempting to measure even the divine by their own standards. And they end up thinking like puerile adolescents. I'll say it again. Sophomoric people. And these people, when they look at Jesus, when the Son of God, says Guardini, himself stands before them, they see only a rebel and proceed against all who believe in him with the heavy indignation of the righteous. Watch out for that heavy indignation, eh? especially if your heavy indignation is based on your own ideas and not the question of seeing the light of Christ, which doesn't necessarily produce, as we call it, the wrath of man. It produces instead the light of God. And when the long-awaited Christ, Jesus, performs his miracles before their eyes, here's what they do. They either refuse to see them, or they actually brand them works of Satan. That's worse, I think. But they do this because they don't wish to see these demonstrations of God's power and love only seem to make them incapable of seeing They become increasingly short-sighted and ultimately blind. So Guardini goes on with his account of what seeing really is. He says, seeing is more than indifferently reflecting, as a mirror like reflects all that passes within range. It's a vital process that directly affects our lives. Okay, So we're talking about a different kind of seeing than sort of just a passive acceptance of our sensory information. We're talking, as Bordini says, about a, a, a living, vital process that directly affects us in the way we live. So to see, to perceive, it means to receive into oneself, to submit to the influence of things, to place oneself within their grasp. So I'm, I'm not just seeing 
passively or just seeing um, uh, superficially. The seeing is actually grabbing onto my heart and calling me to change, calling me to do something. Okay? Right? Um, and and, and that's, that's the point. He says, necessarily, in, in this kind of seeing, I, I would add, the will mounts guard over the vision. In other words, the, the vision is controlled by the, where the will wants to go. Okay? One protection against precarious things, in, you know, even in how we use our physical sight, you, you deal with things that are dangerous, precarious, is you look at them carefully, sharply, so as to discover what's going on with them, discover their weaknesses. But another is to look away, so as to remain unaffected by them. Okay? On the whole, we see what we choose to see. The selectiveness of the individual eye is a protective measure of life itself. And, you know, I think good biologists uh, that I've listened to, even biologists that don't believe in God, can see this aspect of the, uh, the way of the physical sight works. Okay? Um, uh, as a protective measure of life itself. And, of course, Guardini says, this being true already on the natural plane, how much truer is it on the spiritual? And, and for the spiritual plane, for Guardini, means cognizance of others, okay, of other people. So, of the position we take to the truths and the demands thrust upon us, to see another human being, Guardini says, as he really is, means to lay ourselves open to his influence. Wow. Thus, when either fear or dislike moves us to avoid him, the reaction is already evident in our gaze, in the way we look at him. And the eye, here, the eye could be the intellectual vision too, I think. It caricature rises him, turns him into a caricature. You know what a caricature is? It's a sketch that exaggerates something about the way a person looks, a caricature. And in this case, because the person is avoiding that person, listen here, brothers and sisters, that person is avoiding talking to that person. What happens? The person that he's avoiding turns into a caricature. That's exactly right. And notice what happens. The caricature made by a person who avoids another person, um, and he's avoiding him either because he doesn't like him or because he's afraid of some aspect of him or whatever, he stifles the good and he heightens the bad. That's what happens to the caricature. Okay? We discern his intentions. We make swift comparisons and leap to conclusions. How often have we been corrected about rash judgment? Rash judgment's a real problem. Uh, uh, it's a great problem in our society. It's a great problem, especially in all the public means of social communications, where the, the, the truths are out there mixed in with a lot of rash judgment and people running to rash judgment both about facts and about other people to the point where it's very hard to come to a serene appreciation of the truth. I think um, the serene uh, grasp of the truth, it, uh, there's a very powerful uh, 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 image of that and it, to us here in South Bend and I know that the that the, it's known uh, popularly as Touchdown Jesus, but if you really look at the uh, plaque in front of the Memorial Library that explains 
that particular mural of Jesus. It's Christ, the word of life, in the serene possession of truth. That's what a university is for. It's so that, so that we can come to a kind of serene possession of the fullness of truth insofar as we are able. But unfortunately, we're threatened, I believe, by much uh, manipulation of, uh, of truths in the manner I just spoke of. And Gordini is concerned about this process too. Listen to him. He says, all this, this jumping to conclusions, swift comparisons, and all that, it proceeds involuntarily at times, if not even unconsciously, in which case our powers of distortion are uncurbed by reason and they do their worst. So if, if this process is kind of unconscious, and I would add trauma to that. In other words, the trauma that, that affects, affects, affects a person's soul, excuse me, um, uh, can, can shift them into an unconscious relationship with their fear, and you can use that acronym for fear, false evidence appearing real, or you can remember what Father Hesburgh said about fear. What did he say? He said, fear is a very bad counselor. Okay? So, you know, and, and, this, and, and Gordini is saying exactly the same thing. He says, the deeper our fear or distaste of a person, the more tightly we close our eyes to him. Until finally we are incapable of perception or even the... And then he goes to the profound German word for the perception. Uh, uh, and it's called, I mean, it's translated reception of truth. Um, and I can't pronounce the German word, so I'll try it. Uh, war uh, Nehemann. War Nehemann. Uh, reception of truth. Then we have become blind to that particular person. Here Guardini lands the insight that's at the core of this chapter, I believe. This mysterious process that we've been talking about, and I even added some components to it. This mysterious process lies behind every enmity. Enmity, I, would, I could translate that word too. This mysterious process lies behind behind every war. Enmity. Okay? So it could be a divorce. It could be brothers not getting along. It could be uh, families not getting along, Hatfields and McCoys. It could be religion not, uh, not getting along, like the, uh, uh, in, in Ireland between the Protestants and the Catholics in Northern Ireland. It could be nationalities not getting along, Ukraine and Russia, Israel and the Palestinians. Amnity, in, in all those situations, depends on this kind of shutting down of seeing. That's scary. And Gordini makes it even more frightening. He says, discussion, preaching, explanations are utterly useless at that point when everything's shut down. We kind of see that, don't we, in these enmities? The, he, he goes on, the eye simply ceases to register what is plain to be seen. Before there can be any change, Guardini says, a fundamental shift must take place in the general attitude. The mind must turn to justice. The heart expand. The mind must turn to justice. The heart expand. This reminds me, I would, 
I was listening to uh, Bishop Barron, and he was describing uh, modern thought and uh, Catholic social teaching. And he said the two key components of Catholic social teaching, as he was describing it, are what? Justice, giving every person their due, and love, willing the good of another. So not only did he say that that was at the core, he gave the definitions. Well, good for him. I, 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 by the way, I think that that's pretty profound, and I agree with that. But notice how Gordini hints at exactly the same thing. He says, the mind must turn to justice, the heart expand. And how is my heart going to expand? Unless I will the good, even the good of my enemies. But i got to will the good, okay? And that's how the heart expands. Love is willing the good of another, okay? Then, Guardini goes on, only then can the eye really begin to discern. And little by little, the sheen of the object on which it rests strengthens its visual power and slowly re it recovers the health of truth. Notice it's a slow process. It's it's little by little. But are we going in the right direction? That's the question. And then Bordini continues, Jesus Christ is the incarnate Son of God, flesh and blood, revelation with a capital R, in whom the hidden God is made apparent. No one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son, and him to whom the Son cho chooses to reveal him. Of course, that's a quote from Matthew 11. And he who sees me sees him who see, sent me. He was the true light who enlightens every man who comes into the world. He has made and filled with purpose and flooded with spiritual sun. And that's, you know, uh, uh, Gospel of John, a couple different passages. Thus he, Jesus, stands showering radiance upon everyone who nears him. If that person is seeing in the worldly sense, something in him is willed to seek the world in himself rather than the Messiah. So there's a choice. Are you looking for Jesus, the Messiah? Or are you looking for yourself and the world? That's, that's the choice. That's the decision here he's talking about. He, he, he says, um, this person, is, his eye is fixed on the world and self and remains so. Everything else that crosses into his vision is thrown out of focus, if it registers at all, only as something suspicious, ugly, and dangerous. So you start, uh, when, you're, when you're caught in this, blind, this kind of blindness, that uh, Guardini's talking about, uh, all you 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 become suspicious. You see everything else around you is worthy of suspicious and ugliness and danger. Thus, it can happen that a man opposes Jesus with all the passion of outraged reason and order and justice, because the Jesus he sees before him really does seem to be to him an abomination. His, o's, his own eyes have so distorted the light of the world, with a capital L, that he must reject him. That man is one of the unblessed who is scandalized in Christ. Ooh. But is such blindness in the face of divine light possible? If it were a question of the acceptance or rejection of human brilliance, it would be understandable. But darkness before the clarity of God? There, more than anything else, since seeing is a vital act, here Guardini says, since the will to existence stands close behind the eye, and every glance harbors a preconceived decision, the more it is a question of eternal destiny, the more dominant 
decisive that will becomes that choice okay the choice as it affects the site when it deals with eternity okay when it deals with revelation with a capital R when Christ appears everything's at stake that's what he means by his statement for judgment have I come into the world so now we're clarifying what that judgment really is it's the movement of my sight from just the kind of the passive reception of information to the operation of my will of my heart to see light when even when my eyes see darkness if that makes any sense faith is seeing light with your heart and the heart there means will when all my eyes see is darkness love presses me through that darkness he goes on when the messenger of revelation capitalized messenger capitalized revelation again that means God appears before mankind he forces it to a decision one that simultaneously affects himself because he's creator placing his fate in the hands of his creatures it's pretty amazing right he actually is willing to do that in his perfect freedom revelation presents no mere facts to be acknowledged but truth that once seen obliges okay so this is a question of truth that obliges me to respond to it you will know the truth and the truth will set you free but but I it's not a question of being set free if you don't want to be set free see that's the problem with this um, and it demands that this truth be accepted that man surrender himself to it and enter into that which comes from God he who really sees already approaches obedience so the seeing comes with the willingness to obey okay uh, thus the spreading of the gospel of truth necessarily separates people into two camps the willing and the unwilling those who wish to see and those who do not hence those who will see and those who will lose their sight it's to these spiritually blind that the words following the parable of the sower are addressed hearing you will hear but not understand seeing you will see but not perceive for the heart of this people has been hardened and with their eyes they have been hard of hearing and their eyes they have closed lest at any time they see with their eyes hear with their ears understand with their mind and be converted and I heal them this separating of the seeing from the unseeing may occur in various ways Guardini says the decision may come from lightning like at first encounter or gradually in a slow process of ripening it may be made overtly or covertly screened by careful faint or veiled in sentiment and passion but one way or another the decision has to be made in the eighth chapter mark describes jesus healing of another blind man and in that chapter um, he, he starts to see trees and he gradually gets his sight the healing of this blind man Gordini says gives us a key to the mystery of Jesus's rejection in Jerusalem and we ourselves are advised to be in fear and trembling lest the light in us go out Lord let not the light that you're pouring out on our life go out help us to see your light and help us to see light when all our eyes see is darkness and help us to make the good decision to truly see thank you